me into working in healthcare was, um, I suppose, having a couple of cousins who were nurses, and uh, their jobs always seemed very interesting. Um, and when I was at school in London, uh, we had work experience, and I tried a range of roles in healthcare. I knew I wanted to go into something in the healthcare setting, so I did um, some work experience in physiotherapy, medicine, and uh, nursing and it was nursing that actually really captured me. My training was very traditional. It was the old state registered nurse type training, very much an apprenticeship model, if you like. So we st I started my training in the Channel Islands. I did 18 months in Jersey and uh, it was very, very good around understanding the fundamentals of nursing care, but it was also very regimented. You know, there were procedure books to be followed. There was only one way to strip a bed. There was only one way to make a bed. And we even got diagrams on how to fold the dirty linen before we disposed of it into the trolley. And if you were caught making it the wrong way, you had to remake the bed and do it again, strip it again properly. So it was very, very... Um, directed around um, discipline and following the rules and doing what you were told. We weren't allowed to challenge or question. It was, this is what you do. And there was a hierarchy. In relation to race discrimination whilst I was training, um, during my three years as a student nurse, it wasn't something that I personally felt I was, I was exposed to, but I did witness it, um, particularly when I returned to London to complete the second, I did 18 months in Jersey, and then I went back to London uh, to do the final 18 months, largely because the hospital I was at was very, uh, it was just a general hospital with very limited technology, and I felt I needed to go back into a more technological world if I was going to work in more, you know, sort of international health care. And um, so going back to London Teaching Hospital, um, it was quite obvious to me that there was um, some racism um, inherent in the system. It was a majority of qualified nurses, as they were at the time, who were black, were enrolled nurses. And there were older women who came over, probably, you know, during Windrush, and expected, you know, their stories to me would be that they expected to be an SRN, but they were forced into enrolled nurse program. They were, they were really very supportive of me. They saw me as um, a bit of hope. You know, there was a black student nurse who one day is going to be, you know, an SRN and maybe a sister. So during my time as a student, I came across two sisters who were black. There were probably others, but it was a large teaching hospital, uh, but very small numbers. Um, and the majority of the black faces were in enrolled nursing, support worker roles, and domestic and other ancillary roles. So for me, it was, it was sort of an interesting observation. Um, but for some reason, I, I wasn't sort of singled out for any different treatment that I was conscious of. For me, I qualified as a nurse and in terms of finding my first job, it wasn't particularly difficult. And I got an interesting job working as a staff nurse on a, a medical renal unit and I was often in charge. I didn't experience any difficulties with getting a job. I was able to get the first job I applied for and I felt reasonably well supported. I only stayed there for six months as I'd apply to go to move up to Newcastle to do my midwifery training. And again, I applied to do my midwifery training and I was successful in achieving that. On completing my midwifery training, um, I was offered a job as a, a midwife on nights. And then for some reason, they decided they were gonna take that job away from me and give it to somebody else. And would I like to do days instead? And I said, no, I don't want to do days. I wanted to, to work on night duty. Um, and it was a personal choice and I've already got a job offer to work on nights and uh, at the time they were really short of midwives 
So I, um, we, most of the people in our group had agreed to work through our annual leave to provide support because we'd done our time, we'd passed our exams and we were qualified midwives. And um, I was really quite affronted by having this done to me. And I basically said, well, I can leave now, so I'm leaving. And uh, they were really horrified and said, if you leave, you will never work in the Northeast again. And I said, well, that's fine. It's a big country. So I left um, and I couldn't find another job. Um, but I did end up going back to London to do some agency work because I'd got a home in Newcastle. But I felt very strongly that I wasn't going to be bullied into doing something that I didn't properly understand the reason for, um, whether it was cronyism, whether it was cheaper to have an enrolled midwife on nights. But fundamentally, it felt wrong. And it might have been my race. I genuinely don't know. Um, I subsequently got a job um, working in Newcastle. So I moved back and I was a night sister for a while. And uh, then I went off to do health visiting. And I applied to one of the universities to do my health visitor training. And I remember one of the panellists at my interview saying, how did you get into King's College Hospital, as if to say, how does somebody like you get into King's College Hospital to do your general nurse training? And I said, largely because I had the the academic qualifications, thank you very much. So I don't suppose they particularly liked the fact that I would stand up for myself. So I didn't get into that programme at that point, but I did get accepted into another college to do my health visitor training a little bit later. So that I perceive that to be, how does somebody like you get into this prestigious London teaching hospital? It seemed fair to me, um, and it's not that I'm particularly dense, but it was much, when I did my student nurse training, the way in which work was allocated was very much based on the year that you were in. And um, certainly in the London hospital, they defined us by the cap we wore. So it would be, so for my first six, uh, six or eight weeks, I had to wear a paper cap. And once I'd passed the probation, I was given a frilly cap and then a kipper in my third year. So when they were allocating work, they would say, get me a paper cap or get me a kipper or get me a frilly. And it could be any one of us, irrespective of our race. Um, and I remember asking the sister why they called us paper caps, and she said, because you're disposable, which I thought was, uh, I just laughed. Um, so in that sense, it felt much more sort of uh, work was delegated by status, role, and what they believed, the skill that was required. When I qualified, um, I was pretty much in charge of the ward when I was on duty. Uh, when I did my midwifery training and went out on the community, I didn't feel that I was given anything different to do because we have a core set of competencies. Um, so not really. Um, I, I think I've just been that kind of pointy elbowed, you know, sort of get in there kind of person and ask forgiveness rather than permission often. In terms of experience of racism as a, a registered health visitor, um, again, I think if people were being racist to me, it was it would have been subtle, um, because I worked with some really good people who were really supportive and enabling. I'd apply for training and I would get it. I applied to be a community practice teacher and I was given a place at the university to go and do that. And I was supported when I had students. Um, I don't recall ever knocking on a door and being refused entry by a family because of my race. Um, and I'm not kind of in denial about any of those things. Um, and this was in the northeast of England, you know, people were, were generally very welcoming, you know, and I had a large caseload and they would come to see me at clinic. You develop trust and confidence with your families and, and things worked well and I worked well alongside my health visitor colleagues. So again, um, it wasn't something that I personally experienced. But again, I think there were times when I think some of the people who used our services 
I could see that they were living in environments and communities where their race was an issue. And it was really very difficult because you'd have to support them because you're conscious of the impact on, on their safety, but also their mental health and emotional well-being. So things were visible around me and things that were motivated me to try and do something about it. I suppose I think the biggest challenge was trying to work out where I wanted to be and also that kind of grappling with imposter syndrome. So thinking about moving forward in my career and what obstacles I might have faced, I think for the most part it was probably me doubting myself and my abilities and thinking that I had to be so much better. I had to be, I had to know everything about the next job, but also deciding where I wanted to go. And um, it took me some time to be able to do that. And what I decided was that I had to take control. And if I waited for somebody else to help me make my career, I'd be waiting a long time. I was really interested in and enjoying my teaching role in the community as a community practice teacher. And I decided I wanted to take that a bit further. And I was fortunate enough, you know, first application to get a job in a school of nursing as a clinical teacher. And I was then supported to go off and do my cert ed, which enabled me to become a senior lecturer in one of the universities teaching nursing. And again, um, I think I was really fortunate with the support I got from the people around me. I was able to access funding, and that's a very different story now, where funding for degrees and diplomas and other things just don't exist. You've got to fund yourself. So I was, I was able to, um, without being sycophantic or whatever, just say, I, I would like to do that and get support to do it. So that's basically, I think, it was finding people who could help me, who could give me advice about what I needed to do um, and not being proud around asking, you know, my director of nursing or, you know, the chief exec to say, you know, what advice can you give me if I want to do this? And they would very kindly put me in touch with other people to go and have a chat about what I needed to do. Uh, so that's how my career progressed, really. So I taught for a while. Then I became a lecturer practitioner and broke into management when, you know, when we had these health reforms and I was a senior nurse business manager for a children's unit, which um, again was a very interesting experience. Um, it was mixed in that one of the things that I encountered with one particular personality in the team uh, who would tell... And it was really quite an interesting conversation. I was putting in a research bid because we had, um, we were in a very inner city area and we had very few children from black or ethnic minority backgrounds use our service. And you know, it was almost like it was a cure for child illness. You know, if you were black or Asian or whatever, you, you didn't get ill. They didn't use our, our inpatient service to the same extent, even though they were present in the community. And I just wanted to find out why and what was, were there barriers to people accessing our services? And the conversation I had with this particular paediatrician was that, oh, I wouldn't waste your money doing something like that. Um, why don't you do something more important? And it was a biomedical question. Um, which isn't really what I wanted to understand because if people didn't feel able to access our services um, because they were maybe not culturally sensitive or we were missing something, I think it was important that we understood that. Um, and he was very dismissive of that as an idea or an issue. And he then went on to say, um, in the presence of the ward manager, and bear in mind I was a senior nurse business manager in the conversation, that, um, oh, he said, when I worked in... The, um, the black patients were dreadful. And I, and I just sort of looked and I said, really? He goes, oh, they were terrible. And the ward manager was just astonished and to the point where she was hanging on to the door frame um, and looking at him like this. And he carried on and I said, um, can you just stop and tell me why we are such difficult patients? 
Um, and he went, oh. And he actually said, oh, the packies were the worst. And I looked at him and I said, I think you need to put the shovel down right now, largely because it's an inappropriate thing to say. And it doesn't really give me any comfort for you to say that, you know, out of the two races, there's one worse than us. Um, and he actually, I don't think to this day, he thought that was a, a problem. So I'd, I sort of said, right, can you explain to me why black patients and Asian patients were difficult to manage? Well, they didn't turn up for appointments, they didn't take the medicines as prescribed. and did it. So we said, right, can we think about there being a cultural dimension to this? Um, and also English is a foreign language for some people. You know, what did, can we do to avoid those things going forward? And I felt in terms of recognising where structural and systemic racism exists, it's right there. You know, people make assumptions that the service is there. If you choose not to take it, the medicine's prescribed. If you choose not to take them, it's down to you and your effectless patient. Um, so I did press on with the bid um, and I did manage to get some funding from the, the, local, the, region, the local health authority. And we put on some cultural, cultural awareness training across six of the uh, more sort of predominant cultural groups that lived in our locality. Um, I don't think he was best pleased, but, you know, just that conversation alone confirmed to me that it, it's an issue. And uh, if this person can talk and think like that about patients, he's obviously talking and thinking like that about me behind closed doors, but a little bit too savvy to say it to my face because he knows I wouldn't, he knew I wouldn't sort of stand for it. Um, but it was really quite interesting, the look of horror on his face when he realised that I was also black and uh, he was basically berating a whole race um, on the back of his experience in a service where there was no thought given to, well, why aren't people complying? Is it something about the way we are providing the service and how we make them feel when they come into it? So uh, that was an interesting experience for me. I think the experience that I had in that conversation with the consultant really sort of focused my attention on that whole issue of inequality, the whole issue of problems around access to health care and when people do not access health care and that again part of my health visitor training, it drives inequalities in health and that's why people remain less well, less um, less educated, living in poorer housing, living in poorer communities because they have fewer advantages and fewer opportunities. So that experience sort of really sort of convinced me that working in in that sort of environment and thinking about how I could embed it into everything that I did, um, it was really fundamental. And it was the first time somebody had really shone a light on institutional, personal and systemic racism, you know, and being quite bold about it. There are always um, a range of strategies as people try to, what I always felt is tinker around the edges of racism. And the Race Relations Amendment Act came into force and I was a general manager in a, in a mental health and learning disability service across the city with 300,000 people. Um, and again, the population in that part of the world, you know, we're talking small numbers, but in certain communities, it could be as high as 6%. Um, but across the whole population, it could be something like 1.2%. But nevertheless, there was an underrepresentation of people from those communities in mental health services and in the learning disability system. And again, that just pointed to me to issues in relation to access, um, understanding how to use services, and probably some cultural stuff that goes on around the acceptability of um, a diagnosis of mental health and learning disability in some communities. So when the Race Relations Amendment Act came on stream, um, I was 
quite happy to pick that work up. Um, mindful that there's always the tension that people say, well, you would, wouldn't you, being black? But to be perfectly honest, I was keen to do it and I wanted to do it. Um, and the set about developing the Race Relations Amendment Action Plan for the board. And round about that time, we got a new director um, of mental health and learning disabilities who straddled the general managers in both of those services, and I was one of them. And um, she came to meet me as part of her induction. And one of the things she said to me was that when she trained as a mental health practitioner, the psychiatric consultant who was delivering their training told her that black men were more mad and more mad, more bad and more mad than white men. And, and I thought, why are you telling me this? So I basically sort of had a conversation with her about social facts and Emile Durkheim's paradigm around if you create a narrative around any scenario or group of people and repeat it often enough and say it with authority, then it becomes true. And um, that that's why, in my opinion, that there was an over-representation of black men in the criminal justice system and under, you know, higher levels of detention in mental health services. And I said, that explains everything to me. And she was like, it was, she didn't really, it didn't resonate. Um, so I went to do a presentation to the board of my action plan and um, she was present and in the middle of my presentation she announces exactly the same thing that she said to me. Well my psychiatry professor told me that black men were more mad and more bad than white men. And I just despair. Uh, so I'd said in front of the chief exec chair and the rest of the directors and non-execs I said we've had this conversation before. Um, do we really have to fall out about it? And that said to the board, um, we talked about social facts and Emile Durkheim's paradigm and, you know, this is not the case, but what that narrative does, um, and we went through it. And uh, I don't think it changed that person's opinion. And I think after years and years of believing this, um, it would be impossible to change somebody who continued to say it. But it was quite interesting watching the expressions of the, um, the people on the board. And I, I didn't get pulled into the office. I didn't get told off for speaking out of turn because I don't believe that I was. Um, I felt it was really important that the board didn't believe that. Um, and they saw that there was another explanation. Um, so we had lots of conversations as an organisation thinking about why people weren't coming forward, um, were there things we could do differently and better, you know. Um, and I was lucky in that the chief exec and the, t the chair and the people on the board were, were very supportive and they were willing to, to try these things. So I was able to engage with a whole group of different people, um, go and meet um, community groups and talk about some of the barriers to them accessing services. So, and it's it's been sort of at the heart of my work, even as a director of nursing that I subsequently got when I left that organisation in a primary care trust. I was involved in inequalities work. I became a magistrate, um, and again with a focus on how can we ensure that there is real justice and that there's no bias. Um, given the narrative that black men were more bad than white men. And in, again, in the Northeast, there were very few black magistrates at the time, and very few black female magistrates at the time. So I felt that was an important work to do. So I did that for about seven years. And then I was really lucky to um, be appointed with the National Police Improvement Agency. Um, which has since been disbanded, but it was a group that was working um, and reporting to the Home Office around strategic equality, diversity program. Um, and it was, a, you know, there was a Home Office group where Doran Lawrence was um, working and then there was the NPIA group. And it was really looking at what was happening in the criminal justice system, policing in particular, and um, the issues that black and minority communities faced. 
So again, I felt compelled to do that. Um, and I did that for you know, a few years before the NPIA, as it was, um, was disbanded. Um, but it was, it was interesting work. The, the people who were leading that work were really passionate. Um, there, it was 10 years on after the McPherson report and there was a launch with the then Home Secretary and lots of key stakeholders talking about why we needed to change. And I could actually see some green shoots, the way people were thinking about diversity, intersectionality and a whole host of things. And as with most things, you know, it seems when you're talking race, equality and inclusion, it has a shelf life and the pendulum starts to swing back the other way a wee bit. So that's really where I've been. In dealing with um, resistance to the things that I was coming across in management structures, I have to say my chief exec in the Mental Health and Learning Disability Service was phenomenally supportive and accessible and he worked to understand what I was saying and why I was saying it and um, my job my first director of nursing job was in the primary care trust where he was actually the chief exec so again I went into that role knowing how he worked he knew how I worked and he he had a very open supportive style of management so he would listen and he would cre create opportunities where he could i think he well i i hope he recognized me as being honest with integrity and not sort of a shroud waving kind of personality and would come up with robust plans based on evidence um, so in that way i managed to get support i think there were i did take a report to the pct board and um and I think the language of racism um, and difficulties that some people may have accessing our services did sort of, um, I think, jar with one or two of the non-execs. Um, and I think it landed with one particular individual who believed I was accusing the organisation of being institutionally racist and by default they were racist. And I had to spend some time saying, this is not me saying anybody around this table is racist. It's actually how can we assure ourselves that we cannot be accused of institutional racism because of the way in which we've designed our services and the way in which we provide our services to a diverse community. And he was very prickly about that. He, he really found it difficult to hear. Um, so I would give an example of working with a group of, of Muslim women who really culturally struggled with receiving obstetric and gynaecological and other female um, type services from male medical staff. And um, again, for some people that's difficult to understand. Um, or, you know, even things like when we were doing health and well-being programs, going to the swimming baths for some of the women in these communities was just not possible because of the cultural mores that they have in place. And I was, again, my director colleagues were really very good and my public director of public health um, was incredibly supportive and understood um, that we needed to maybe think differently about putting on um, women only sessions for swimming access to the swimming baths and things like that so again working with people who were prepared to listen who were prepared to explore different ways of doing things I've, I've found kind of helpful and I think being more senior in a system makes it easier um, but that said I've always been like well, this is what I think and here's the evidence and this is why we need to do it and this is the risk associated with not doing it and not doing it well. And I think most systems, or most reasonable systems, respond to that sort of approach. If I found myself in a system where they weren't prepared to listen, respond or do anything differently, I don't think I could stay and I would, I would leave.
I did a year's work with the Department of Health around turnaround um, after I left the, my role as a director of nursing. So I, I joined the Department of Health turnaround team and we went into organisations that were struggling with particular issues. Um, so I did that for a while and then I did a bit of consultancy work and spent some time working in, a, in the independent sector and managed a, a private hospital for a little while. And that was interesting because it was um, a hospital that provided care for medium and low secure individuals who had um, learning difficulties. And uh, they recruited quite heavily from abroad, predominantly Africa. And um, <coughs> they would, they let, you know, I went to one of their um, equality and diversity meetings, the very first one, and they basically told the recruits on joining the organisations that they just had to expect racism when they got here from the client group because that was the nature of the client's behaviour and um, and because they came knowing that they would be racially abused by the clients it almost you know there was no responsibility or duty of care to rule that out so my response back to the director of HR was you know these people are here um, and, you know, and going through very expensive behavioural programmes for behaviours that challenge or behaviours that are often criminal in nature. And if you can change that and manage that, then surely you can change this and try to educate them and change how they speak to the black staff and the things that they say and do. Um, and if you can't do that, then challenging somebody's you know, sort of offending behaviour is probably impossible to achieve, in my opinion. So I think it needs a rethink. And just because somebody chooses to come doesn't mean they've, they're have they willing to tolerate and they shouldn't have to tolerate racism. So that was one of the places I didn't stay very long. I think I did a couple of months and I was like... Well, when I was a director of nursing, I worked with the Royal College of Nursing um, on their regional board in the North East. Um, so, and part of the portfolio that I had is one of the regional board members. So I was still employed in the NHS, but as a member, I was one of the, the people that supported the development in the region. And um, I did do some work with the staff and other members around equality and diversity. So I had that connection with the team before I even went back and became an operational manager in uh, in Sunderland but it covered the whole of the North East and yeah I did you know I supported the um, the officer that was leading on the multicultural nurses network ensured that we maintained a focus supported our, our BAME nurses um, as the phrase that's in use at the time and um, basically continue to work to support our reps and our stewards to understand the impact of and the disproportionality of, of race. I, I got engaged in the Royal College of Nursing corporate work around equality, diversity and inclusion um, because I've had, I suppose, such you know varied experience of it um, that it's important to keep contributing and to keep learning, especially because it changes, doesn't it? You know, how it manifests itself. You know, it's like a virus. It morphs. And uh, um, so it was really important to me to keep connected to that work. Um, I then became the regional director in the North West about six years ago and um, retained that connection. I am now the, the co-chair of the England Equality, Diversion and Inclusion Steering Group. Uh, so supporting that approach primarily for staff, but also developing staff to ensure that they support our members effectively when they face discrimination in the workplace. Uh, I'm also a member of the Northwest BAME Regional Assembly, which has been established by NHS England and NHS Improvement. And that's been a really, that's an ambitious piece of work, um, supported by 
by that, you know, that structure and that hierarchy. And it include it covers the whole of the Northwest. We've got some really senior people who are really passionate about making a difference. And the ambition is to have a, a, an NHS in the Northwest that's actively anti-racist. You know, anti-racism being a positive choice we make in our organisations as opposed to non-discriminatory. So, you know, it's dismantling those systems and working with people to change things. I also work with the GM Workforce Race Equality Steering Group um, and that covers the whole of the public sector that's signed a pledge, including Transport for Greater Manchester, the police, the fire service. And we're all trying to work, well, we all work towards the same goal because fundamentally we're working with the same people. When you start to shine a light on things that are racist, that are discriminatory, that have disproportionate impacts on people, um, I think the perpetrators of those acts shift either subtly or significantly the way those things appear. Um, so they either go underground, um, they, you know, they, they write, develop policies, they develop practices, they develop closed groups that sustain those thinkings, but they know what people are looking for. So they do, does that make sense? They go out of their way to maybe avoid detection, um, but it's still there. You know, the actual problems that people are facing in the workplace and in the communities haven't gone away. Um, but the way in which people talk about race, the way, you know, no longer are we in a situation where people can put no blacks, no Irish, no dogs in the, you know, when they're letting rooms or, or accommodation. Um, they can't and they shouldn't be allowed to be racially abusive to people because that's been classified as hate crime. So that's what I mean. And now we've got the keyboard warriors who go on to social media and spill their, their vitriol that way, um, pretty much undetected. But I think even that will be coming to an end soon. Um, so that's what I mean. There are many people that want to change, you know, many not, you know, many white people allies who really do want to change this. And I'm not saying that everybody in the NHS or the public sector wants to maintain the status quo, but we know these people exist. You know, we know the ones who are hard right exist and they exist across the board. And it wasn't well, I can't remember what decade it was. It was probably in the 2000s when somebody actively leaked the list of BNP members. And it was really interesting to note um, how many people were in roles in the public sector, how many people had quite senior roles in the public sector that were ascribing to the BNP values. So, you know, I don't think we need to say much more than that. You know, people have their beliefs and those beliefs sometimes spill over into their place of work, which it shouldn't. But we see it, don't we, with the way in which policies are applied. So the stop and search, some of the aggressive use of force when restraining black people that they believe are perpetrators. You know, we see that. Um, so it's how do we continue to shine a light on it? How do we continue to look for it? And, you know, we're not going to stop people subscribing to the far right or having those views, but they shouldn't be allowed to bring them into work. And I think there are things that, you know, there's a phrase, isn't there, turkeys don't vote for Christmas. So when we start talking about equality of opportunity, um, when we start talking about fair and just access to career progression within a diverse community, within a diverse workforce, the people at the top will potentially be thinking, that could be my job. 
So do people get defensive? And, you know, everybody needs to work, everybody needs to have an income. And then you have the people at um, the lower end who think, oh, you know, hold on, they're giving these people a leg up. What about me? You know, the non-black people who are living in, you know, deprived communities who don't believe they've got privilege. Um, so when we talk about white privilege, they don't feel privileged. But the reality is, alongside the black counterparts in the same community, they are less likely to be stopped and searched. They're less likely to be followed around a supermarket and made to prove that they've paid for the goods in their shopping bags, that sort of thing. And I don't think they appreciate it, but they're equally deprived and feel disadvantaged. So they're those sorts of things that we need to be always mindful of, that in focusing on getting rid of um, discrimination and disadvantage for our black communities, there are people who are potentially thinking, well, I stand to lose here. Um, but in, in, in effect, what we should be thinking is that we're trying to level up. We're not looking at, you know, taking anybody's, uh, anybody's rights or entitlements away. And I think one of the things I would say to people who are in those really difficult, those communities where there is disadvantage and they feel a lack of opportunity because of unemployment, you know, workless, you know, housing, all sorts of, you know, lack of opportunity is that, you know, there is no moral high ground in that place. You know, we're all standing in a ploughed field and, you know, the margins are really small. And if we can make everybody's life better in that community by not fighting each other and believing that this person who's come in here is taking something that you have, um, because that kind of narrative perpetuates things and um, it perpetuates some of the attacks, some of the abuse, some of the the vulnerabilities of uh, people who are different. When we were watching the news from Wuhan, and it just looked absolutely surreal. Um, so we, I was watching this and talking to my colleagues, you know, what's going on, you know, it is... It was escalating in that country and it was moving. Then it went to Italy. You know, we were getting stories from Italy, stories from Spain. We could see the health systems crumbling under the, the weight of care that was required and the, the absence of adequate resources. And you, you start to think, why aren't we being a bit more proactive? You know, we are an island after all. And, you know, we had probably more opportunity than those people on the European continent and, you know, to to lock down our ports. I was starting to think, when are we going to take some action? Um, and it was almost, you know, we waited until we got the first two cases in the UK, travellers from Europe, I believe. Um, and then it just went, you know, it just went exponential, didn't it? And um, as, as a an organisation that represents nurses, but also um, lobbies on behalf of people who use services. You know, the Royal College of Nursing really got into gear and started lobbying for PPE, you know, uh, making sure we had the right sort of masks, that people who needed them were properly tested, because it's no good just giving somebody a mask. You know, there was a lot of conversation around what is an aerosol generating procedure, and should they have the, the F FP masks, you know, FFP two or three masks, and it was it was a battle at times. We knew what we could see, what was happening in the care homes, and the fact that the advice early on was to discharge people from hospital back to care homes, back to the communities, to create capacity for the acutely ill with COVID. And at that time, there wasn't a testing um, system in place, so there were lots of things that were were being lined up for the perfect storm. And uh, we just didn't seem to be able to make enough PPE. We weren't able to get the right PPE. We were getting members from the BAME community, black nurses saying, I have to take my own PPE when I go into work in this care home because there isn't any, or I'm being deployed to work on a COVID ward. And then you start to see images of the people who died, you know, healthcare professionals who died from COVID. And, and I started to think, this is just me, because I'm black. 
only noticing the black faces that were coming up on the news. And there were just more and more and more black doctors, black nurses, black support workers. And, and it, it was just like, you know, come on, it's Stephanie, you're just being paranoid here. And I remember saying to one, I was talking to one of my regional director colleagues and he said, have you noticed? And I said, I have, but I thought I was being paranoid. And I'm cross with myself that I needed my observations validated. But there are times that you do. Um, and that really led us to start having a bigger conversation about the vulnerabilities and the need for risk assessments. And one of the things that we were really clear about in the college, working with our equalities lead, was that this isn't because black people are biologically different. You know, there was something else going on. And what we didn't want is to open up a whole eugenics movement. You know, we are human as everybody else is. Um, but there is just something, is it about different treatment, you know, with different lifestyles, whatever it was, the impact was more likelihood of contracting COVID and the outcome being extremely serious if you were black more so. So um, that's that really was, we, you know, we were fighting on many fronts. Um, trying to get the right equipment for our nurses in all of the care sectors, trying to ensure that there were proper risk assessments done and that the equality and diversity, you know, the the disproportionality was, was addressed. Um, and working with, and again, across the Northwest, I think we've had some great success working with the system. Um, but we could always do better. You know, I'm not saying it's perfect. We were getting numerous calls from our black nurse members to say if there is a, a job that needs to be done, somebody needs to move to a COVID area, it's invariably one of us. And we had a situation where a nurse on a Saturday was speaking to one of my team really distressed because she was singled out to go to a COVID ward and her manager said, you're going to go there on the Monday. Um, and she said, well, I don't want to do it, but can I have a risk assessment first? And she was told that she was too young to need a risk assessment um, and that she would be going. So she phoned the RCN, thankfully. And although it was a Saturday, you know, the, my member of the team and myself got involved. And, I, you know, I think this member advocating for herself, really powerful, because not many people have that kind of courage. And she did eventually get a risk assessment and um, she shouldn't have been moved to a COVID ward because of her personal circumstances. She was living with vulnerable older people. So none of that would have been identified had she not dug her heels in and contacted us. Um, and as she said to us, you know, why me? When, how did they arrive at the decision to move me when there were six other people of a similar grade? And none of them were asked. So, and that was a fairly common story. Many examples of good practice. And um, I can think of one particular organisation where the chief exec has been front and centre in leading um, the support for the whole system in the community in which their organisation's based. Um, so even down to there's a care home that's running out of PPE. What, what are our supplies like? Well, we've got enough for X number of days. Can we send some? So there was that sort of thing. You know, this person had a much more, a much wider view than, you know, I just need to look after my people. I just need to look after certain groups of my people. She worked very hard to support people from diverse communities because we've got, you know, a raft of people from different nationalities because of international recruitment to, to plug the workforce gaps. So this particular chief exec, I would say, was, I'd say, one of the shining lights. Um, a couple of chief nurses in other trusts doing very similar things. Um, another chief exec set up some research to look at what was happening with the you know, the ethnic minority nurses in his organisation and 
spoke to us about it and I was involved with his EDI lead talking about how we approach it and how we build trust and confidence in, in those nurses to feel safe coming to work um, and how do we get the right messages out to them. And then that once um, the vaccine um, appeared and was available and we saw the vaccine hesitancy, much of it built on the fact that nobody trusted the system because of the historic experience. And I remember people saying to me, well, we're never first in the queue when there's anything good going. So why are they giving us, why are they allowing us to have the vaccine first? Are we like human guinea pigs? And people were saying, no, I don't want it. I'm not going to have it. But there, there were so many vulnerabilities for, for our people that, you know, we had to find a way to work with the communities, with community leaders, with individuals, to to give them the assurance that actually taking the vaccine was probably safer than catching contracting COVID. Um, and again, that was something that across the whole system in the Northwest, there was a real commitment to. Um, and trying to get messages out in different ways, trying to work with people in different ways. And I've been very impressed, you know, with what they've tried to achieve here, doing research in different parts of the region to find out where the, the largest level of vaccine hesitancy is. Because to call people vaccine refusers felt a bit punitive and actually people were just hesitant. You know, I had, I had to take the vaccine and I actually agonised about it, you know, do I do it, do I not? And it took a long time for me to work, to process it. Um, and I'd got to where I needed to be by the time I got invited for my vaccine. But, you know, it's normal, isn't it? You know, if you're going to be um, injecting something unknown into your body, you do need to work out what the risks and implications are. So, and we had to find a way of communicating that information in a way to the different communities um, to give them confidence in what we were saying and that we were not just um, mouthpieces for a government. And, you know, there were so many um, fake messages coming out and dealing with those things was really challenging. And, you know, constantly, you know, developing a narrative for, well, you know, we're not, there's no chip in the, in the vaccine, you know, you don't, Bill Gates doesn't need to chip you. He just needs to see, look at your phone to see where you've been. Look at you, you know, check your cookies to see what you're up to. You know, people got very, very paranoid and understandable, I suppose. In the face of the, the evidence around disproportionate deaths and infection rates in the black and Asian minority population in health and in other sectors as well. The RCN was working really hard with NHS England um, to, to drive um, a request for understanding why that is. Um, there were lots of um, suggestions put forward, you know, living in homes of multiple occupancy and different age groups and a whole host of things. But you know, fundamentally at the heart of many of this was disadvantage, you know, a history of disadvantage and lack of opportunity and people living less um, privileged lifestyles. Um, so we were having these conversations, we were working with our members um, to address issues around COVID safe environments. So if people were concerned about their place of work, you know, we were getting many calls at the beginning of the pandemic and we were responding by speaking to employers across the piece around what they, you know, what assurances they needed to give us so we could assure our members that things were safe. Um, if people weren't getting proper fit testing for their masks and they were vulnerable in COVID environments, we were fighting for that. But we were also fighting for proper reporting of COVID infections because that is, you know, there's something called RID or reporting. Um, it's a work-related injury, essentially, being exposed to a substance that create causes illness or, and or death. So we were fighting really hard for accurate RID or reporting. The health and safety executive's position was that you need, employers needed to have a reasonable belief 
that they contracted COVID whilst at work. And when somebody caught COVID and they said, I've been looking after COVID patients repeatedly, so as a result, my viral load would be higher, employers would say, yeah, but you could have picked it up in Tesco's. Uh, so that reasonable belief was really hard to challenge. Um, so we were fighting for that. We were also fighting for a death in serve, death benefit um, because obviously if you could prove that somebody had um, died of COVID contracted in their workplace, um, we fought to ensure that everybody, including student nurses, were eligible to have this benefit. But again, it's really difficult to prove and it's really hard for families to fight for at a point where they are consumed with the pain of loss. So... Um, you know, we just continue to fight for good PPE um, when we have issues where people were getting opening boxes of masks that had a use-by date that it expired, crossed out with another sticker on the top to say they're safe to use. You know, you have to question, well, is that really a safe mask to use? Subsequently, they decided that no, they weren't safe and they destroyed all of those masks but a number of our members in the first wave when we ran out of masks were being forced to wear masks that were not fit for purpose so they were the sorts of things that we were fighting on a daily basis but we we're also working really closely with the system to try and influence and get improvements around the quality of risk assessments the consistency um, a whole host of things. It's been exhausting. I think it's been really an emotional journey um, because at the back of it is fear, fear of the unknown, you know, this invisible virus. Um, on me personally, um, I shielded and I feel like I've been in choky and solitary confinement for the last year and a bit. Um, and that was, I mean, I just sort of wrapped my head around it and just thought, you know, this is it, I'm safe, I can work from home. I felt really guilty being afforded that luxury in many ways that I could work from home and I could be protected when there were people and I was watching my nursing professional colleagues on the front line um, every day, not without that level of security and protection that I had. So there was a little bit of guilt, but you know, and I, you know, you have to work through that as well. Um, but I was using my work to try to make things different and make things better for our members, but also for the people that we serve. Um, it's been a really difficult time. Um, I don't, I think I'm quite good being on my own and in my own space. So I, you know, I'm aware that there are lots of people who've had real sort of psychological, emotional problems as a result of lockdown. Um, I've been quite robust around that, but I know that not everybody else has. So it's been a really difficult time. It's beyond deeply disappointing. It makes me angry, it's frustrating. And one of the things that we go back to when we talk about COVID, you know, the vaccine hesitancy is about trust, you know, and as society, we have a compact with our government to look after us, to make decisions that are in our best interest and the best interests of the country. And when you're being misled, um, it makes it difficult to rebuild trust. Um, so I just think we're in a really difficult place right now and um, honesty is required, but that trust and confidence that we were trying to rebuild around the, the vaccine, um, I think it's probably been shot to bits, but it does make me feel very angry. I feel very concerned and saddened for families that have to listen to this, who have lost loved ones. Um, particularly when you get, you know, the ministerial advisor saying lots of people died unnecessarily um, because of the lies and lack of preparedness. You know, everything aside, that's not something a bereaved family needs to hear or should ever have to hear. Um, and as a profession, it's not our members deserve better. You know, nurses and the medical profession deserve better. You know, we don't need lies. The social care sector, the, the ring around it, they deserve better. 
and it's deeply disappointing. When I think about uh, racism, it is in my head, in my mind, easy to um, link it to a pandemic. What starts off as a germ, a little tiny piece of behaviour, or maybe a big aggressive piece of behaviour, left unchecked, it spreads. And one of the things that I fundamentally believe is that what you condone, you know, if you ignore something, if you let it happen, you support. So the more people that condone, look the other way um, when racism is happening, and it happens every day to many, many people, when people look the other way, that spreads like a virus. And I think what, what we see and what we've seen following the death of George Floyd is an equivalent pandemic where the whole um, impact of racism has gone, you know, it's global and everybody is starting to recognise it and everybody's, well, a lot of people are feeling something needs to be done. It was a really sad time um, and it caused a lot of reflection and there were a lot of people around me who were reflecting and it kind of opened up the floodgates in terms of people sharing their experience and um, listening to people that I wasn't aware of who had had really awful experiences. We searched long and hard to develop a vaccine that would cure and prevent um, COVID-19. We've talked for years about action that would address racism and we're still talking about it, it seems. We're producing reports, there was just one yesterday about Islamophobia that the Muslim community feel is watered down. We've seen the Sewell report that says racism does not exist. And if we had said the pandemic didn't exist, then we probably would have a lot more people dead and damaged as a result. Um, so in my opinion, like a virus left unchecked spreads, causes harm. Racism, like a virus, spreads and causes significant harm. And what manifested itself to me um, following the death of George Floyd were the number of people who had been significantly damaged because of racism in their past and probably in their present still. And I was shocked and hurt to hear their stories. And I appreciate that by comparison, I've been very, very fortunate. Um, looking at it and trying to change it um, is very different to living in it. But you still feel impotent when you're there trying to shift the dial, trying to make things stick once you've changed and improved something. But it just seems to morph back or change direction. So, for me, um, it's been a very difficult year for everyone. Um, George Floyd's death has shone a big light on it, um, <clears throat> and I've been, I've been affected listening to stories and hearing from people that I never thought for a moment had had some of those experiences. And I'll say, I'd say to some of them, "Why didn't you tell me?" Um, and they were like, well, they were either ashamed, they, they just want to pretend it hadn't happened, but the death of Joy Floyd seemed to just open the tap and uh, I don't think people can go back. They shouldn't have to. It's really corrosive and it does call, cause illness and it does damage lives. So like we're looking for a cure for that pandemic, we need to find one for this.